Okay. Hi guys, um, as Paul just said, if you want to stop me to ask any questions, just feel free, go ahead, throw up your hand. Um, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is an area that I got into over the last about eight years. Um, my primary interest uh, when I went to university it was in geography and I did a BA in uh, geography and sociology. Uh, then I continued on and I did a, a postgraduate in sustainable development. So it's not very uh, developer orientated and you're probably wondering what I'm going to be talking about. But um, so I'll just start off just a quote on what geography is. And it's the uh, study of places and the relationships between people and their environments. I'm sure everybody in this room has uh, done geography in school at some stage. Uh, some of you might have dropped to a junior cert or continued on or whatever country uh, that you've done it. Um, so I continued it on and really very interesting. You get more in depth into the kind of concepts and the ideas and uh, you know, the patterns of development. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so this is basically the kind of uh, idea that I want to get across to you. So 80% uh, of all data is geographic. So uh, everything that we talk about, you know, if we're talking about customers, markets, uh, places, where we went on holiday, um, we're basically talking about something geographic. And uh, that's kind of where GIS comes in because maps are so common nowadays that we... Um, uh, we can basically visualize where we've gone, where our customers are, uh, just pretty much anything, or 80% of all information. Um, so just to uh, give you an idea of how I got into GIS, in 2008, I, um, I went to Edinburgh and I did a, a urban and regional planning. It was a one-year master's. and. Uh, if somebody actually said to me when I was there that look, GIS is going to be a big a thing in the industry in the coming years. So you know, it might be an idea just to do a technical subject. So I did my uh, major in that, and um, yeah, it was, look, it was pretty intimidating stuff for somebody who wasn't very technical at the time. And and uh, a, the vast majority of my co-students, uh, they actually didn't do. There was only three of us decided to do GIS out of all those town plan out of fifty planners. So um, I can't blame them because it is a pretty tough subject to get your head around. Um, so I did a dissertation on um, it was online flood mapping, and I was looking at how it could be used by planners to improve, you know, better decision making, um, you know, more informed decision making, construct the right things in the right places, and. Uh, Yes, yeah, so I carried on, I gr graduated anyway, thank God. But um, So my experience with GIS really started. Uh, so I mentioned that I went to Scotland in 2008 to study planning. Uh, pretty bad year to be studying town planning and especially to be graduating. So I actually hopped on a plane and I went to Australia and it took me about a year to kind of find work that was really relevant to my field. Um, I actually spent, I actually just moved back from Australia. It was about um, uh, three months ago now. So just getting, to, getting back into the swing of things. But my experience was I got into uh, oil and gas consultancy. And at the time in 2008, Queensland, uh, which is on the east coast of Australia, it was really exploding with work because there was some four uh, huge projects were starting up over there. And I think they had a combined value of something like, you know, 200 billion or something. So anyway, there was a lot of work and there was a lot of people involved. Uh, the company saw that I had some GIS experience and they said, yeah, we'll take you on and we'll just, you know, you can make maps for us. So when I was there, I was basically making maps for planners, engineers, environmental officers, surveyors, geologists and project managers. And it was a big, big, complicated system. And it was, to be honest, it was really, uh, it was, I was thrown in the deep end because I didn't really know GIS that well at the time. Um, so uh, these are the type of maps that I would have been making. Actually, they're very <laughs> simplified versions, but we would have been looking at environmental regions. Uh, we would have been looking at statistical areas. We would have been looking at administrative regions. Uh, council areas, you know, all the different people that would have a, uh, an interest in what was happening on the ground. Uh, also tenements, that's the kind of system of managing resources and, you know, um, 
allocating what can be done where and at what time. Um, so after that, I just I won't bore you too much with the experience, but I just think it's good to give a bit of uh, context. Um, so I was working with a council and I was in the infrastructure and services department and what they were doing is they were uh, doing strategic planning for the next 20 years and just deciding what services were needed uh, and uh, such as parks, roads, sewage and they were looking at all different types of data sets which um, uh, such as employment figures, house price, uh, census, uh, population uh, statistics and also zoning regions, so we were using GIS to um, make those kind of predictions and to crunch up the data and to try to make sense of it all. Um, okay, so maps, yeah, uh, maps have been around a long time. Uh, we've been trying to visualize what we know. Um, uh, back in the day, maps were really like, you know, if you were able to make a map, you were pretty powerful because, you know, to be able to have be able to have that, you know, shows that you have an interest in a certain kind of region. Nowadays, everybody has maps and, you know, I don't, don't think people appreciate the kind of power that we have uh, in this day and age in terms of being able to do, you know, just about anything and find out about anything. Um, so first map in Ireland was made in uh, 150 AD. It was made by a Greek or somewhere like that. Anyway, he sailed around the coast of Ireland and that's what it looked like. And um, yeah, it was a pretty uh, a poor depiction of what Ireland was like, but we've come a long way since. And look, everybody, you know, everybody who's Irish pretty much could, you know, knows the image of Ireland pretty well. And, uh, you know, we've divided it up into our counties and, you know, we play football and hurling against each other and uh, everything. So, um, yeah, there's two main types of maps, and uh, this is, uh, so there's, one is a topographic map. You might notice that on the left-hand side, a topographic map is basically tells you exactly what is where, and, you know, there's no kind of BS about it. It's just purely factual, and, you know, they use very um, uh, clearly defined rules to represent information. And those kind of maps, everybody's familiar with Ordnance Survey maps, and it's um, uh, pretty, uh, it's pretty standard stuff. Then also there's thematic maps, and that's where you choose a specific team. Um, and in the case of the map example that I've chosen, it's uh, from daft.ie, and it's from 2010, basically. What they were doing is they were showing the, uh, where the house prices were highest um, in the country. So the, that's the theme, and they represent it by doing a, a quantitative um, a color value for, so red is pretty, you know, high prices. Um, and that's two simple examples of uh, topographic and thematic. Um, sorry, wrong way. Uh, so location, um, location is everything really in GIS. Um, Location is pretty much, nowadays, it's like as important as being able to tell the time correctly. A lot of industries rely on location for, you know, uh, services and infrastructure and utilities. Um, so, where will I start? Yeah, the, the uh, top left is um, uh, just an example of converting coordinate systems into something which would be suitable for the local region. Um, the big picture in the center is just an example of how you use different projections. So um, depending on the projection that you choose to use, um, it can skew the map in a big way and that can cause big problems for people who rely on uh, GIS output. And just for example, you know, uh, if you were to tell somebody to drop off a, I don't know, a, uh, road supplies there, but it actually meant to go there. You know, you're in the middle of the ocean and that's a big problem. Um, then also, just a quick example of uh, how people are kind of getting around location. There's, uh, there's a company in England and it's called What Three Words. And what they've done is they've actually divided the whole uh, globe into tiny grids. And each tiny grid has a, uh, a unique identifier and that uni unique identifier is three words. So for example, um, this one is shows coffee boss. So shows uh, dot coffee dot boss. 
and that's a unique identifier. So if you were to tell your friend to come up to my house party, uh, you know, instead of giving them a big long address, you know, you can do it that way. So it's just an example of, you know, people thinking outside the box and really kind of using maps. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick one on projections, I won't bore you, but that's kind of the science of, you know, how you can distort the world. And it's, the way you should think about it is, it's like this projector in front of us is projecting on a flat wall and uh, everything's cool because it's, that's how it should look on my computer. But imagine if that wall wasn't flat and it was a sphere, then you'd need to modify the projections, the, the, the output to suit that sphere so it would um, show correctly. Um, so that's all mathematics and look, I know nothing about that kind of stuff. I just, you know, I just kind of wangle it. Um, uh, you know that you just have to match up the correct projection to your output and your data set. And um, that's just one of the primary rules for GIS is uh, projections. Another one is, oh, oh yeah, okay, data. Um, so in term, this is getting into your world now, um, and I'll slowly kind of ease into that. Um, uh, as a cartographer, it's all about being able to visualize the data and the, uh, so a cartographer would be like a old, uh, it would be GIS officer or GIS specialist. Now, so the cartographer would have to have certain considerations and, um, you know, stuff like just how a map looks, um, the shapes that we use, the orientation, the colors, the the line uh, thickness and, you know, the, uh, the, va the values. Sometimes you can use subtle colors. Uh, for example, big areas uh, like a country would use a kind of very subtle uh, um, a beigey kind of color. But then if we wanted to identify a small little region, we'd use a bright color because it helps it stand out. So, um, you know, then we also have to consider, uh, this was a big one when I was working, the audience, uh, who the map was for. Because depending on who you were giving the map to, uh, it was very important that you know you kind of represent the stuff correctly, and you show the correct stuff. Because uh, big decisions might be made on a paper map, just like anything, any report or. Um, also, uh, just with the um, the output uh, scale is a very important factor because you can't create a, a map output that will necessarily work on your iPhone because um, it needs to, it just needs to be look right. You know, you need to be able to take it out of your pocket and be able to uh, see what you need to see without, you know, either uh, trying to get a magnifying glass. So it's the same with paper maps, same with computer maps. Um, and then, so I just included a painting because look, people know what a good painting is. Uh, people know what a good map is unknown to yourself. People kind of, have that kind of standard of visual appreciation. Um, so spatial information is another, um, uh, I forget where I'm going with this one anyway, but uh, so we're projecting information onto uh, imagery or it, not necessarily imagery, but we want to project it onto somewhere in the world. So all our information, we said we mentioned that 80% of data has geographic components. So what does that data look like when we're trying to bring it into GIS? So um, in this case, if, in terms of GIS, everything is visual. It's either a point, it's either a line, a polygon, or else it's annotation. So I'll just start with points. Um, every, uh, at a certain scale, every town or city, we would use a point to define that region. Um, a, at, but if we were to zoom in further, we would notice that that town would actually be a polygon. It would be a self-contained kind of shape. And within that town, we'd have, you know, uh, blocks of um, uh, um, your residential blocks or, you know, uh, zoning or whatever. And then things like linear features would be um, roads or uh, rivers or those kind of uh, Things. And then annotation is just to, you know, help us out, help us kind of, you know, name places and all that. 
So behind every uh, GIS uh, data is a actual spreadsheet, or you know, it's it's a it's a, a database of information. So that's the kind of stuff that you guys will be working with, and uh, GIS is basically just visualizing it. Um, so, sorry, do you have any questions? I kind of rambling. Okay. Uh, so a typical GIS file would consist of the following. Um, uh, the GIS files can have many shapes and forms, but I'm just going to use the standard shape file uh, that most people would learn GIS with. And the shape file we would contain, first of all, the geometry, you know, uh, just the kind of shape that it should look like, if it's a point line polygon, where the distribution would be. The next one would be, um, uh, don't quite understand that one actually, but it's something to do with being able to search the information, it's spatial index. Uh, the next one would be just like an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV, the DBF, and that it's, that's like a database behind the information. And the last one would be uh, relating to the projection systems um, and coordinate systems. Uh, layers, this is a big one in uh, GIS because uh, on the left, you, that's the kind of system that you'd be working with. The, uh, the desktop software, uh, the open source one would be uh, Quantum GIS. It's really powerful actually, so I'd recommend checking it out. So uh, there you have your kind of uh, tables behind the information. So for each kind of polygon or each point, you would have some kind of information that you could query. Um, then uh, this just here, that's an example of layers in action. So you can just think of it as a cake, you know, with different kind of layers of whatever. Um, so that's an extract of piece of, like, uh, of uh, land. And, but if you're looking at it in terms of GIS, you're looking at, uh, you might be loading in data sets that might be soil or land use or you know, pipeline utility networks or roads or boundaries. Um, also buildings um, might be all that kind of stuff, you know, and you, you might be filtering out information and highlighting some information and doing this and that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just included in, yeah, so a big consideration when I was working was, and it, like, it would break your heart sometimes, but it was a big one. And it was, was the infrastructure existing or was it proposed? Because that's a very, very important one to consider. Um, uh, so existing infrastructure would basically be a solid shape or a sh solid line but proposed, you'd, you'd use, this would be an example of cartography where you'd use dashes just to indicate it's not quite there, but you know, it's being planned. And then uh, just to, at the bottom, uh, different pipelines that would be used would be, we'd use different colors to represent them and oil would be green, gas would be red, slurry uh, would be yellow and water would be um, blue, obviously. So, uh, but then you always need to bring in the kind of, you know, just the touch in terms of tweaking the uh, cartographic aspects to make sure it just jumps out at you when you have a map, because that's, that's really important. Um, so typical GIS considerations, I might have gone through a few of them. Uh, coordinate systems, you've probably heard of coordinate systems, but they they can differ depending on the projection system that you're using. You might have latitude, longitude, or eastings, or northings, which would be in meters. Uh, and also, you can throw in another one. It's um, this is where you get your 3D from. It's uh, uh, Z values, and it's in terms of elevation. So if you have a data set that's 2D, it's flat, and you um, you give some elevation heights. That's where you can actually, you know, start turning it into a 3D. Um, uh, raster and vector, I'm sure you all know about this, but you know, it's like a SVG, scalable vector graphics versus pixelated information. They both have their own strong points and they have, but they have their own purposes. I won't go into it, but uh, both are very necessary. And some people even in GIS, they say, are you raster or are you vector? It's kind of like, are you oasis or blur? And it's um, uh, because like raster, you spend the next 10 years trying to kind of learn the analysis techniques that they use. Um, I'll just go into one, for example, that they, they could show raster and they could bring in value, associate the raster with values, and it might be a river or a lake, and they could drop a point on the raster. And based on the environmental data that they have, uh, they could say, well, right, if there is a flood, 
and that point is lifted off to a certain location, where will it end up? You know, in ten years or five years, or, or not necessarily years, but um, yeah. So that's an example. And then uh, just in terms of the going from two D to three D, um, if you have your elevation values, then you can actually distort it and turn it into a three D. Um, so that's that's pretty. Uh, that's quite intense kind of stuff, and that's the kind of stuff that people study in. A university for four or five years just to learn how to really use that kind of 3D stuff. Uh, uses of GIS. So I mentioned that I was working with planners and engineers and all of those surveyors and stuff. But really, like I don't see any. Like they're the kind of people who learn GIS in college, and you know they they have their purpose. But I really don't see any reason why all the other people couldn't be using GIS because you know I, there's so much. You know, just. Everybody loves visual information, and I think that you know we should be using it and a lot more. I mean, we all use Google Maps, and we benefit from that. So uh, that's just my own kind of um, bit of a mission, really, is to kind of make sure people are using uh, GIS. Um, typical users in Ireland. I hope they don't mind me using their uh, you know logos, but um, uh, logistics DHL. If you're delivering, you know just delivery networks. Um, Cork City and County Council would use GIS. Um, board gosh, you know, linear utilities, and they need to be able to map their stuff. Uh, Irish Water won a big award over in the States recently because, look, they wouldn't win any awards over here, but in terms of how they used the Esri software, um, they, they used something like called a geo database and they just managed their information really well and they impressed the software provider and they won, you know, they were, they were um, commended on their achievements in that regard and uh, that's really kind of using GIS to its full capacity and, um, and then uh, air code, you'd be aware of uh, that and um, yeah, so McDonald's, you're probably wondering why they use GIS but they're such a big company and they're always like building stores. They probably build like, you know, you know, a couple every day on average or whatever. But um, they, um, so when they choose the location of their uh, uh, store, what they do is they, uh, they look at their data, different data sets. They use, look at population. They look at where the built up areas are. They look at um, uh, where the roads are. Can people turn into this area and pick, Get their you know Big Mac at dinner time or whatever, and it's just look, it's just business. They but they're using it, and they've actually have their own kind of model designed to uh, predict where the best area for their store is and where they can maximise their profit. And look, that's an example of business just you know using the tools that are out there. Um, so air code, um, air code use GIS, and their whole point of that is to uh, make Ireland a bit more efficient in terms of how delivery delivery systems are used, especially for all going into online shopping. I mean, you know, uh, if stuff can be delivered faster, then, um, you know, it's, it's, it means increased efficiency of resources, uh, better logistics. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure everybody would like to know that an ambulance would be able to get to their house uh, as fast as possible and air code kind of helps people do that um, and also you know just um, other kind of aspects of monitoring activities and um, so anyway air code there's 130 or 139 uh, air code distinct air code areas in the republic and uh, so they have this routing key and the uh, the unique identifier so just combining the two of them they kind of Every area, everybody's area has a, um, a unique identifier. And I, I think it'll make things a lot more efficient down the road uh, for a lot of companies. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, so GIS in action. This is just a little kind of um, a bit of aerial imagery that I just took out of Google Maps. And it doesn't really mean anything, but I'm just going to do a slight demo. So. For example, it's, I think it's from Florida or somewhere, but um, 
Uh, if local councils always have different kind of reasons for using GIS, and one of them might be, I've heard of them do this, uh, um, you know, if there's a water shortage, basically uh, people aren't allowed to use a lot of water and therefore swimming pools will be a kind of, um, a, you know, it, it, it needs to be a regulated kind of area. And um, so anyway, so some kind of GIS officer, usually a young fellow, might be tasked with kind of identifying where the swimming pools are and checking them off against the database of authorised swimming pools. So he might come along and he might say, oh, these areas, they're not authorised, so that's an issue and he might go to his manager and might go down different kind of, you know, um, uh, chains of command. Uh, another area, they might decide they need to just measure distance from a house to a, a coastline or I think that's a lake. And another one might be, somebody might be constructing a house and they might need to uh, know where there might be an issue in terms of noise, pollution or uh, dust or something from construction, so they might just do measurements. That's a very simple example of uh, the GIS tools that you have. Um, uh, it's a very, very powerful and uh, there's some software out there. There's um, a model builder, which is basically you have a kind of... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, so you use it to validate information, to update databases, to pull from servers and to uh, do clips, to do buffers of information, to have all this different information. And that's a software called FME. And uh, big, big uh, utility companies would use that to take in huge amounts of information and process it. But like, you know, you need to, it's basically GIS on steroids and you really need to respect it because, you know, it needs to be spot on. It'll change your information and uh, yeah, so, then just a little spreadsheet. Um, uh, yeah, look, everybody's using uh, GIS and they don't necessarily kind of realize. It. So, you know, we all have uh, smartphones, well, most of us do. Um, you know, we might decide to go grab a coffee with a friend, but we might know where a uh, cafe is and we need to uh, find directions. So, you know, if you want to go for an hour and four minutes to get a coffee, that's fair enough. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so Google Maps, you know, that's basically GIS. So I just want to demystify a few kind of um, uh, visualizing information. I mean, look, you know, Obama won the 2008 election, but what better way to say it than just to create a map and just to color the map. So that's, that's thematic mapping and it's blue is Obama and McCain is red. Um, so even though the red looks like it's kind of one the, you know, the bigger state or, you know, the bigger populations are in the smaller states on the uh, East Coast. Um, so the future of GIS, I'm kind of getting there, guys. Uh, there's lots of resources out there. Some you might know, some you might not know. Uh, the first in the top corner, uh, left corner is OpenStreetMap. That's basically the big rival to uh, Google Maps. OpenStreetMap is a community of uh, uh, developers and mappers and what they do is they take uh, um, uh, aerial imagery and they digitize roads, they digitize houses and they, you know, if they know some information, if they know what a road is called, they go to that database, they log in and they change the road name so it's up to date and if, you know, there's a new building, they might just do the kind of community some good and uh, update it. Google, on the other hand, uh, don't quote me, but as far as I know, they actually they don't have that uh, voluntary community uh, to update their Google Maps. So it's a it's a big business mm -hmm. consideration. Esri is a big one of the big players in GIS, um, and they're an American company, and they do a lot of the desktop, and they're moving into the uh, web mapping so uh, site as well. And then Bing is you know uh, Bing. Uh, there's other resources in terms of building your own applications in the cloud, uh, GIS applications, Mapbox and CartoDB, as well as Google and Esri and Bing and uh, OSM. Uh, but they these two basically would use draw on the uh, Google resources and the uh, you know the um, the big providers, and they'd build applications and allow people to build applications and upload their data into their cloud. 
Um, you, be, you guys would be familiar with all of these, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, SQL. They're all used by uh, GIS, either web mapping or desktop. You know, so uh, it's, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in any, but it was definitely used. Um, and then the desktop software, just a few examples on the right is uh, Global Mapper. Uh, map info. Those two are not free. Uh, I'm not sure about Global Mapper. Um, and then QGIS and Grass. Uh, they're open source and they're well worth checking out and having a play around. Um, uh, smart cities. I'm just going to finish up pretty soon. So you all know the way information is going in the future and technology. You know, it's going to be kind of automating everything and. Uh, I think that GIS is really going to be uh, underpinning a lot of that uh, mapping, you know, geolocation and uh, those kind of aspects. So, um, I, you, so just, you know, Cork City and County Council, I, I don't know, should I be using their photos, but it's just my opinion that they'll probably be considering these aspects down the line that, you know, automation of uh, waste management and uh, uh, driverless cars and... Uh, you know, it can lead to a lot of efficiencies, such as uh, traffic light signals that change uh, when there's, depending on the volume of traffic at that time. Um, you know, lights that might switch on at certain times when needed and when not needed, they might go into power state mode. Uh, also, you know, like drones just for delivery. Um, that's going to rely on kind of maps because they just can't be flying anywhere. Um, uh, so. Another example would be uh, just simple kind of ways that people could be using GIS. Uh, you know, it, when tourists come to Ireland, they generally do the kind of Cork, Galway, uh, Cliffs of Moher, Dingle, Cork, and back to Dublin route. But like, Ireland is so much more than uh, that simple route. And uh, it's kind of a shame that, you know, people aren't using maps to promote their areas better and look now's the time to be doing it with social media if you ever want to do it so uh look you know you could, like we have the wild atlantic way and it stretches you know down the west coast and that's a fantastic idea and it's it's really good but i'm sure people could be coming up with their own ideas and that's what i hope to kind of share with you just you know come up with any ideas uh, i think this is the last slide anyway so uh we're moving into the age of big data with APIs and open data governments all around the world to be, I think, in my opinion, to be competitive and bring in investment. They open up their data sets and they let people make sense of what they're doing and, you know, make business decisions based on that. So that's a, actually a big opportunity. And also, you know, just like with uh, Facebook, like it or, you know, don't, but uh, you know, we can track people's kind of movements and their um, activities and their spending patterns. And so this on the right hand side is an example of a uh, typical town planning kind of zoning map. And I read this article really recently and it was really interesting. It was like, look, what pl town planners do is they look at a uh, town center and they zone and they say, right, OK, well, agriculture, residential, um, you know, in industry. But, you know, they might say, that, look, this blue is going to be uh, retail. And this article that I read anyway was like, look, um, they might think it's nice to be zoning for retail in certain areas and, you know, that might have been the traditional retail areas, but um, what happens when people start buying online? Because town planners don't necessarily kind of analyse those patterns. Somebody else would associate it with them, but um, so if it's just something to think about that if you can be kind of hooking up your... Uh, you know your decisions regarding development or geography with kind of the information that's out there you know you can make better informed decisions and you know you might even decide that look at christmas time we're going to change into a pop-up shop that'll sell you know uh, christmas jumpers and then the summertime we'll open up a uh, ice cream um a, a shop and yeah, so I think that's the last one anyway. Uh, yeah, so thanks. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you have any uh, questions.
Yeah, but as far as I know, uh, latitude and longitude are polar coordinate. So, sorry, what is it? Latitude, latitude. Yeah, and longitude. And longitude are polar coordinates. Oh yeah, yeah, they. So all the projections are necessarily wrong, whatever the time. Uh, no, it's it's a kind of big area that you uh, um, it, sometimes Gosh, you'll use. I saw the Mercator projection. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, yeah. It allows to trace straight lines from yeah. one point to the other and have the right uh, distance. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, you have the planet sphere. Yeah. That's uh, another yeah. perfectly fair way of, uh, but they are both wrong, actually. Okay, right. I, I, to be honest, I just did a quick Google search of a lot of images, and I just, you know, brought it in. Um, I was just kind of, you know, illustrating how important, you know, projections and coordinate systems is a very important aspect of GIS. And uh, you know, we would have been switching between uh, lat long if we are, you know, or else the um, we'd also be using, you know, eastings, northings especially with infrastructure projects when we need the very uh, uh, specific kind of coordinates that people could be using on their GPS devices. So... Yeah, GPS devices provide polar coordinates as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's and right. vectors and arcs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not my... Uh, yeah, I, it's just something that I've kind of been using and I, I wouldn't really uh, I have yeah so is that okay mm -hmm. okay okay um, thanks for, thanks for.